All right. Please pray with me. Dear Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations upon all of our hearts be holy and acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Let's say you were a shepherd outside Bethlehem over 2,000 years ago. You're watching your flock by night. In a short while, the night will be shattered by the appearance of a messenger from God. An angel, backed up by the heavenly hosts, will announce a child, a new king born in Bethlehem. Yeah, we know that story, right? But I want you to consider today what was going on before the angel arrived. What are you experiencing? The cold of the night? The bleeding of the sheep, probably a night just like any other night. But what do you see? Surely you see the stars. Perhaps you even may notice a new star, uh, the same star that the Magi will follow, or perhaps not. Perhaps the store, star recorded in Matthew would only be noticeable by a trained astronomer, like the Magi, not a lowly shepherd. But still, there was probably be one other sight that you would see on that night. Now this is not recorded in scripture, but it's recorded in the land, in the geography surrounding Bethlehem. About three miles from Bethlehem is a sizable hill. And on top of that hill is a palace. You can visit the ruins of that palace even today. At the time of that first Christmas, that palace would have fires burning every night. They would serve as an early warning detection system. If the fires were burning, the world would know that King Herod the Great retained his iron-fisted control over the region. And those shepherds gathered in the fields would most likely, surely they would have seen those fires burning. They would be reminded every single night that King Herod the Great was in charge. Now, this was not the only palace that King Herod the Great kept. He was so paranoid that he kept a multitude of palaces throughout the region. He wanted places that he could go and hide in case there was trouble. The most famous place that you may have heard of is called Masada, an almost impenetrable fortress not far from the Dead Sea. Herod the Great, though, didn't build just palaces. He was constantly building. He built cities, he built roads, he built monuments. He rebuilt the temple in Jerusalem. This would be the same temple that Jesus taught in. It would be the same temple in which Jesus turned over the money changers' tables. In fact, today, if you see footage uh, from Jerusalem of the Western Wall or the Wailing Wall, that's not part of Solomon's temple. The Western Wall is all that remains of Herod's temple. Now, after the Romans had taken over, Herod ruthlessly moved into a position to rule the, the area on behalf of Caesar. He was racially Arab, religiously Jewish, culturally Greek, and politically Roman. And this mix of contrasts created in him a fear that often resulted in violence. His brother-in-law became a little too popular and then conveniently drowned in the swimming pool at a palace party. Herod murdered his favorite wife along with three of his sons because he perceived them as a threat. The Romans were well aware that Herod was a thug and a gangster. Caesar himself once commented that it was safer to be Herod's pig than to be Herod's son. The pig had a better chance to survive in the king's Jewish household. If you were a shepherd watching your flocks that night, you would see the fires burning from Herod's palace and you would know that the world was made for those who have power. Those who controlled. Those who were in charge. And those in power will do everything and anything to retain control. 
And that includes slaughtering all the children in Bethlehem and the surrounding areas. Now, this is our last visit to Bethlehem. We began our conversation about Bethlehem over a month ago, talking about Ruth and David and Micah. We gathered with the shepherds, the angels, and the magi to celebrate the birth of Jesus. And now that Christmas is over, Rachel cries for her children. Honestly, this is not the way I wanted our visit to Bethlehem to end. But, unfortunately, human history is often the story of mothers crying for lost children. We understand the reality of war, of genocide, of gulags and concentration camps. We know the meaning of special words like Columbine and 9-11, Sandy Hook and Parkland. In his twisted mind, Herod the Great understands something fundamental. This king that's born in Bethlehem is a threat to Herod's kingdom. He's a threat to all tyrants, all bullies. He's a threat to the idea that might makes right. Jesus Christ turns the world upside down. The name of Jesus, Yeshua, means savior. Yet Matthew mentions another name for the Messiah, Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Christmas is not about the warm fuzzies, although right now I could use some warm fuzzies. Christmas is about a God who is with us, even in times of grief and loss and fear. God and his son Jesus will be with us through our, both our joys and also our sorrows, through our triumphs and our tragedies. The Christian faith is not an escape from our problems. No more than celebrating Christmas will remove the sting of financial difficulty or the loss of a loved one. The promise is that Christ will be with us through our problems. And on the other side of those problems, we can find resurrection, the promise of new life. It's interesting, you may not notice this, but pick up Matthew chapter two again, read through it again. Matthew repeatedly calls Herod king until one point in the story. When the Magi show up and they give their presence and they bow down and worship Jesus, suddenly Herod loses the title. For the rest of the time in Matthew, he is no longer King Herod, just Herod. Why? Because there's a new king in town, friends. A new king. And yes, it is true that the children of Bethlehem will suffer as Jesus is rescued. He and his family will become a refugee in Egypt. However, there is a day that Jesus will suffer for all of us. The cross is the final stand for people who want to follow Herod's way. But Jesus will brush away the finality of death like it's a cobweb. Henry Wadsworth Longsfellow was a huge supporter of the Union's cause in the Civil War. He saw the struggle as a righteous one. It was a fight worth having. Then his son enlisted. He went off to war, and on November 27, 1863, his son Charlie was shot. The bullet traveled from his left shoulder across his back, skimming his spine, and exited the right shoulder blade. Charlie survived that battle, but he ended up crippled for the rest of his life. Longfellow was devastated. In fact, it was this, plus other events in his life, other tragedies that he was facing, it, it, it challenged his faith. The celebration of Christmas made no sense to him. In the darkness of the war, when it was still raging on, when there was not even clear what the result of the war would be, he wrote a poem about his experience. I heard the bells on Christmas Day, 
Their old familiar carols play and wild and sweet the words repeat of peace on earth, goodwill to men. But then Longfellow reflects, there's something wrong. There's something just not right. And then from each black accursed mouth, the cannon thundered in the south. And with the sound, the carols drowned of peace on earth, goodwill to men. How can we celebrate Christmas in the midst of tragedy like this? In the midst of our difficulties, in the midst of our troubles. But Longfellow reflected on this and he was able to find peace. To discover the truth that Good Friday means that Easter is coming. Then peal the bells more loud and deep. God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. The wrong will fail, the right prevail. With peace on earth, goodwill to men. I find it fascinating to think about those shepherds on that first Christmas who look up and see the fires from Herod's palace and think of the power and authority that Herod has over their lives. But then the angels come and break through that. The angels with their de- declaration of this child who's born, glory to God in the highest and on earth, goodwill towards those with whom God has found favor. Those fires don't seem so important anymore. Herod no longer seems like he's got the, the whole world in his clutches. Herod is a has-been. Thanks to Jesus. You know, this meal that we take, it's a strange one, isn't it? We talk about eating flesh and drinking blood. How bizarre. But what's interesting is that this table reminds us, reminds us of the suffering of Christ. This table reminds us of the cross. And we're to declare it until he comes again. Not because we want to wallow in misery, not because we want to wallow in suffering, but but because it's part of our lives. And the important point is not just the suffering, but the suffering leads us to redemption, to victory, to love eternal. This table in which we remember the Lord's death also points us to his resurrection. That this meal becomes a meal of victory, of thanksgiving, of gratitude, of love and life. This meal points us the way out of the difficulties, out of the folks like Herod that seem to have control of this world to the kingdom that belongs to our Lord. Amen.